Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter 1, we'll be beginning in verse 19 this morning. If you have a scripture journal, you'll find that on page 48, page 48, Second Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. Would you stand with me? You're going to hear from, ne- from God now. You're going to hear from God. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would now bless the reading of your word, that your people would heed it and cling to it and leave here, Lord, full of gratefulness and changed. How thankful we are to be called your children by grace through faith in the Son. And so now as your children, we are asking you to have your way in our hearts for Jesus' sake and our good. Amen. You may be seated. Last week we saw at the conclusion of chapter 1, Peter is giving you and I, this congregation, he's giving you two reasons for why you can trust the Bible. This Bible that you hold in your hands. He's giving you two reasons that you can trust all the promises contained therein, including the promise that Jesus is coming again. And Peter's first reason that we discovered last week was very simple. You can trust the Bible because the writers of the Bible, he, Peter, you can trust what what Peter writes because he was an eyewitness. He saw things firsthand. What he's writing and what the other apostles are writing isn't coming from some kind of hearsay. It's not coming from an outside source. They've experienced these things as eyewitnesses. But... In giving you that reason to trust the Scripture, he doesn't stop there. And praise God he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just give you the fact that he's an eyewitness. He tells you another better and more wonderful reason to trust the Bible. Peter knows that as wonderful as supernatural experience might be, the fact that As marvelous as the reality that he is an eyewitness, as wonderful as that is, Peter knows that experience is subjective at best. Experience is subjective. You and I might say to Peter, well, Peter, it's very amazing that you've experienced the transfiguration. That must have been unbelievable, um, literally unbelievable to you because you started talking craziness. And uh, it must have been amazing and wonderful. We're so grateful for that. But you and I might look at Peter, we should, and say, but there simply has to be more than supernatural experience. There has to be more than subjective eyewitness accounts. Experience just isn't enough. And just this past month or two, we know that to be true. Not too many states down south. Take what many call the Asbury Revival. Day after day of worship music, teaching, and people coming from all over the nation, even outside of the nation, to try and, quote here, catch the Spirit. Like catching the Spirit, like the Spirit would be some kind of germ or insect that you could take home with you. That's not true. How do we know, 
How do you and I know? How do you know that what was happening at Asbury was a true experience of the Lord? How do you know that what happened at Asbury was true revival? How do you know if any experience is really the Spirit of God at work? How do you know? Well, you could ask eyewitnesses, right? You could ask those who were there, and they'd tell you all the stories. And they'd certainly seem powerful. They certainly would sound magnificent. They'd certainly sound like something really big was happening in Kentucky. They would. But even when you ask them about their eyewitness accounts, their experiences, how could you know for sure that what they are saying, what they even experienced, was still from God? How could you be sure that it was truly supernatural? And the answer to that is very simple. It's the exact same answer that Peter gives you this morning in the text. You can know that experiences are true by testing the experience against the perfect and sufficient Word of God. You don't let experience be the standard by which you then judge if something is true or not. Can't do that. The standard is not supernatural eyewitness experience, but rather the preeminent standard is the supernatural revelation. God's Word is the standard. This is the standard. And that's what Peter has said at the beginning of the book, right? Peter has not left you to your own devices here. He has been very clear at the beginning of his book, of his letter here, about the Word of God. Look there with me, chapter 1, verse 3. Seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him. Knowing Christ, knowing Him and His Word right here, is all that you need to live a godly life. This book trumps everything. This book validates experience. Experience doesn't validate Scripture. Scripture validates experience. God right here will tell you whether or not an experience was truly from Him. You might experience something, but if it doesn't line up with the Scriptures, we cannot deny the experience, but what we can deny is that the experience was from the Lord. And so you need to look at Asbury. And you need to do as the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 4 says to do. He commands this. Test the spirits to see if they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So how do you test the spirits and the experiences to see if they're of God? And again, the answer is, hold the experience up against the perfect standard of God's Word. So, the experience at Asbury. Okay, I don't mean to pick on Asbury, but this, you need to know. The experience at Asbury is one of spiritual disorder. If you read the accounts of the eyewitnesses. Spiritual disorder. All kinds of craziness going on there. God's Word in 1 Corinthians 14 says this. And, which, by the way, 1 Corinthians 14 is a chapter written all about the Spirit's work in worship. That's what the chapter's about. Here's what the Spirit looks like in true biblical worship. You know what it says in 1 Corinthians 14? That true revival, true worship that is of the Spirit will not be disorderly, but full of order. That's God's word in 1 Corinthians 14. That's what the standard says. That's not the case at Asbury. There were several instances of charismatic craziness going on when that was going on weeks ago. Not order, but disorder. Okay? Or you look at the experience at Asbury and the role that the local church has to play in that revival that some are calling it. Hold that experience up against God's word. God has promised in the Gospels, in the book of Acts, and throughout the New Testament, that there is one main way that he will spread his kingdom, and that is through the local church. The local church 
It's very plain throughout the, all of the New Testament. What is the means by which the kingdom will be expanded? The local church. The gates of hell will not prevail against the local church. If the local church isn't being strengthened, if the local church isn't involved, it's not revival. And Asbury left the local church behind. Consider also the experience at Asbury where you have women preaching. You have LGBTQ student groups helping to lead worship. Compare that experience with the standard of God's Word. The experience is in total contradiction to the Word of God. Is this experience what God told you how He would bring about revival? No. Revival is the exact opposite. It's marked by repentance away from those kinds of sins. It's marked by repentance, including the repentance of rejecting the sin of the created order. Right? You're, when you have women preaching, you're rejecting the created order of God. In fact, you've got men abusing women by putting women in places that they shouldn't be in. That's abusive. We want to talk about abusive. That's abusive. We've got women preaching in mixed gatherings at Asbury. They are sinning. And men are sinning by abusing women, by putting them in those positions. And then if you have students leading worship services who are LGBTQ affirming, students who embrace that which is an abomination to God, sinning, you have all three groups sinning, men, women, students. And these are the leaders of the movement called a movement of God. You can be sure according to the standard not the experience, you can be sure according to the standard that that experience isn't true revival. It's something, but it's not of the Lord. That might not make everybody happy, but I am just being consistent with applying God's word to an experience. So listen to 1 John chapter 4. Again, beloved, beloved, we love you. So don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. That's 1 John 4. You're to test the spirits, not by an experience, but by the standard of God's word. God's word is the final and only sure word. The sure word that any experience is of the Lord or not. And Peter knows that. So I want you to notice the similarities between what I just read in 1 John 4 and what Peter is talking about in his letter. 1 John 4, many false prophets have gone out into the world. What has Peter been saying? What's Peter going to say in chapter 2 and chapter 3? Many false prophets are out and about. They're in your churches. And Peter's telling you, don't listen to them. If you have a New American, you're going to see at the top of chapter 2, what is the title that the New American Standard has put there? The rise of false prophets. Peter's telling you, don't listen to them. Hold fast to what is true. Hold fast to the sufficient word, the perfect standard. Remember these things. I was an eyewitness, Peter says. And the reason you can trust my account, the reason you can trust what I've written and what we as apostles have all written is not ultimately because of our experience. The reason you can trust the old prophets of old, all the Old Testament, the reason you can trust all the New Testament, is not ultimately because of our experience, eyewitnesses though we may be, but rather because God is the author. He is the one writing these things. If it was not so, you could not trust what we've written. God has given us his word. And Peter says it's a more sure word. It's more sure than any experience. His word is the standard. And his word has validated what Peter and all the apostles have said. That's verse 19. I want you to see this. Verse 19 in the New American is, I think, well rendered, but it's not perfectly rendered. If you look at the original language in the original Greek, 
It's actually more clear what Peter's saying. So I want to show you what the original language actually says. It says in the original Greek, the wording is slightly different. It just says this. We have more sure the prophetic word. We have more sure the prophetic word. The prophetic word is what makes everything that Peter and the apostles are saying more sure. What validates the experience of the apostles? The prophetic word. The word. The word. The standard is the word. What's the prophetic word? Well, that's the Holy Scriptures. Peter would probably be referring to the Old Testament here. So again, Peter is saying everything that the apostles, including himself, have seen and heard with Jesus is actually a fulfillment of the first 39 books in your Bible. He's saying these first 39 books have all been fulfilled in Christ and that validates what we ourselves are saying. It proves to you that what we are saying is from the Lord. And we have the more sure prophetic word. Jesus is what the entire Old Testament points to. Right, Ever since the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 3 where you have this promise of a coming Messiah who's going to crush the head of the serpent. Right, He's going to come and reverse the curse. He's going to come and save God's people from their guilt and condemnation. That's the Old Testament. The Messiah is coming. He's coming. He's coming. Time and time again throughout the Old Testament you have through types and shadows. This is the truth. He is coming. And that's Peter's concern in verses 20 and 21. He wants to tell you that. Look there with me. Verse 20 and 21. In verse 20, Peter says, you don't get to approach the scriptures and make them say what you want them to say, do you? No. Look in verse 20. Know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. God is the author. There is one correct and right meaning of a passage of any kind of scripture. These men, these prophets of old in the Old Testament... And all the apostles, like Peter and Paul, these men were carried along by the Holy Spirit, verse 21, as those moved by the Holy Spirit who spoke from God. That's the truth. God is the author. And so if, if you and I write a letter, we intend for that letter to convey a particular meaning, do we not? Do we not? Go ahead. Okay, so we hope that the recipients of our letters or our communication, we hope that... Uh, that they understand what we are conveying. We don't ever send a letter. We don't ever send an email. We don't, we don't ever communicate in ways where we say, well, I, I hope they get the meaning that I never intended. It's not the way that we communicate. Just put it in real life. None of us in here, when we write our last will and testament, hope that there's some kind of hidden meaning in our last will and testament. Would you appreciate anybody taking your will and opening it up to just fanciful interpretations? Very plainly, upon death, my children will receive all of my money and possessions. Plain as day. Your neighbor comes along. <laughs> well, I, you know, they loved me a lot. I could kind of be considered their neighbor. I, I could kind of be considered one of their children. Give me some. That's not what you'd like. You wouldn't appreciate that. That's not the way to do it in real life. Don't approach the scriptures that way. Don't approach the scriptures some kind of fanciful, willy-nilly, whatever you want to believe. It's interesting how you've got engineers who will talk about, hey, if you're building a bridge, 100 feet means 100 feet. This engineer was going to look at this engineer, and if they disagree on what 100 feet is, they got a problem. Right? There's going to be a big drop. We don't do that in real life. 100 feet means 100 feet. There's one interpretation. Boom. That's how life works. If you get Pulled over by a police officer, and they say, you were speeding? And you say, well, I know the sign said 55, but that's 55 to you. To me, it's not. It doesn't work. But for some reason, when we get to the scriptures, we think we can flip things around. Well, that's normal life, but in the scriptures, you know, we can be a little bit more willy-nilly. How dare you? How dare you do that to the word of God? Don't do that. So verse 20 and 21, very, very clear, I hope. God has said, I've spoken. And he has an intended meaning in each and every part of the Bible that isn't up for some kind of relativistic thinking. 
God, through the prophets and the apostles, is the author of the Bible, and he has authored it with intention. God is the ultimate author, and he's authored it with intention so as to validate experience, so as to validate the experience of the prophets and the apostles. Okay? If what he's written doesn't, if what the apostles have written doesn't match up with the prophets, what they've written is wrong. You have to compare the apostles to the prophets. Does God validate the apostles through the prophetic word? And the answer is absolutely. So how should you, if you're to follow verse 20, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, but you should uh, understand it a particular way for the intended meaning, how should you interpret it? You should interpret it according to the very one that, that, that the prophetic word pointed to, Jesus. If you remember in Luke chapter 24, Jesus is on the road to Emmaus. He's hidden from uh, two, two of his followers are there walking on the road to Emmaus. They don't recognize him. And they are really bummed that Jesus has died and suffered, just like he said he would. And they are telling Jesus these things. They don't recognize him. And what does Jesus tell them? He looks at them. And he says, you are foolish. You are slow to believe all that is written about the Messiah in the law and the prophets. That's the Old, Old Testament. That's the prophetic word. You're foolish. You're not seeing what you're meant to see. The scriptures are written about me. Interpret the Old Testament in light of me. It was all about me. So if you want to interpret the Bible so as not to be called a fool by God, how should you interpret the scriptures? According to Jesus. According to Jesus. You should understand the Old Testament according to Jesus. So let's just do that for just a moment, okay? Let's start at the beginning. Let's start at the beginning. Let's put into practice verses 19 through 21. Let's just put into practice. Adam, created in the image of God, right? He's ruling over the earth and he's, he's to subdue it. Uh, but Adam and Eve, they fell. He transgressed the law of God, right? They ate of the fruit. And then what they do? They ran away from God. They ran away from their responsibility. They didn't own it. They didn't own it at all. And so what happened? Sin and death reigned from Adam on the way down through the generations. But then, Jesus came, the Messiah. And he was the new and better Adam. The second Adam. Who went to a cross to pay for the very sins that Adam committed. Adam ran away. Jesus set his face like flint to Jerusalem and did exactly the Lord's will. And through the one man, death reigned, but through the new and better Adam, life and victory reigns. So we could sing with that song, See the true and better Adam come to save the hell-bound man. Christ, the great and sure fulfillment of the law, in him we stand. Think about after Genesis 3, time goes on, the wickedness of man becomes very great, it gets greater and greater, so much so that uh, the depravity of man is on such great display that God says, I have, I'm going to flood the earth. But in his great mercy, he picks Noah out, causes, he calls him to build an ark, Noah builds the ark with his family, gets into it. Who shuts him in? God shuts him in. So Noah is in the ark. God seals him in. It's a work of God. And then the reign of judgment comes. From above and below. You can't escape it. It's everywhere. You can't escape the judgment of God. It's coming from all directions. And yet those who are in the ark the judgment of God is turned away in a far better way than being saved from some kind of physical flood water. Jesus Christ comes as the better ark. So that Romans 8, 1 is true. There is no condemnation for those, who, what? In, in Christ Jesus. You're in the ark, Noah, you were saved from the judgment. It turned away in a far better way for those in Christ. The judgment is turned away and onto the ark itself, onto Jesus. 
He's the better ark. In the same way, the Israelites, thinking about the book of Exodus now, the Israelites, they're captive in Egypt, right? In captivity. And God delivers them through the Passover. You remember this, right? What's going to happen, right? It's the same thing kind of with Noah and the flood. Judgment, death deserved, is going to enter into each household. It's going to take the firstborn of each home unless the blood of an unblemished lamb coats the outside. Unless you're covered in the blood. That shouldn't be too hard to see, huh? In a far better way, the Son of God, the firstborn of all creation, Jesus, gave up His life to cover the sins of all who would repent and believe in Him. And the Apostle Peter says in his first letter, if you go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, he says this, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. How can I trust you, Peter? Because this is a fulfillment of all the way back in Exodus. The unblemished blood, the unblemished lamb, the blood of Christ. Christ is the better Passover. And, you know, that's kind of neat. Israel is saved from the wrath of God. The wrath of God passes over them because of the blood, and then they are released from their captivity into the promised land. God promises to take them into the promised land. But if you belong to Jesus, he does one better. He promises to release you from your bondage to sin, far worse than Egypt. And he promises to bring you home all the way to glory, a better promised land. So you could sing again. We're going to sing this later on. Uh, this is all my hope and peace. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. Just a few more, okay? I think this is fun. They're on their way to the promised land through Moses. God erects a tabernacle, right? The, the tabernacle. And uh, it's a portable sanctuary. It served as a place of worship for the Israelites. What does the tabernacle represent? It represents God dwelling with His people. Exodus 25, 8, God said... Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. You hear that phrase? Construct a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And then the shadow in the old gives way to the new. In the New Testament, John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and what? Dwelt among us. Who was that? 13 verses later, Jesus. full of grace and truth. Jesus tabernacled among us. Jesus, your king, dwells in you too. He, he dwelt among us, and now in Galatians 2.20 it says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me through the Holy Spirit. What a sweet fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus Emmanuel, God with us. The tabernacle points to Jesus and how one day we will live and reign with him forever. Think about within the tabernacle. Just a, just, just a few more. Within the tabernacle. What's in the tabernacle? We're gonna, we find all this in the book of Leviticus. You got the menorah candlesticks. You guys remember those? The menorah candlesticks in the holy place. And they would burn continually to symbolize the eternal presence of God. How are you to see that according to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21? How are you to understand the menorah candlesticks in the tabernacle? John 8, 12, Jesus is the light of the world, the fulfillment of the candlesticks. The altar of the incense in the holy place. The altar, what does that symbolize? It symbolized prayer, right? An aroma pleasing to God. That's what we find in the book of Leviticus. How are you to understand the aroma offered at the altar? Ephesians 5, 2, walk in love as Christ loved us 
and gave himself up for us a what? A fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Jesus is the pleasing aroma. You got 12 loaves of bread in the holy place in the tabernacle. John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. You got the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, and that lid on the Ark is called the mercy seat. Do you remember this? The mercy seat. And once or only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies, past that curtain, and they could get to it on the Day of Atonement, they could sprinkle blood on the Ark's lid called the mercy seat. And who is our great high priest now? Hebrews 4.15, amen, you got it. It's easy, right? <laughs> Jesus. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin, Christ Jesus. So on that day when Jesus cried out, it is finished, it's done, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He propitiated the full wrath of God. He drank the full cup of God's wrath for the sins of the elect. That curtain on that moment was torn in two. So that Hebrews 4.16 is true. So then with confidence you can draw near to the throne of grace. That you may receive what? Mercy. The mercy seat. In Jesus you have the better mercy seat. In Jesus you have mercy. And you can find grace to help in time of need. Now I hope you see Jesus is the fulfillment of everything in the tabernacle. Last one, Leviticus 16. In Leviticus 16, God's instruction to sinners was that they would take a goat and they would lay their hands on this animal and it would symbolize their sin being expiated through this animal. That animal would then be taken outside the camp. You, what, what does that symbolize? Your sin being separated from you. Did not Jesus go outside the camp to bear your sins, to, set, to, to take your sins as far as the east is from the west? He is the better scapegoat. Leviticus 16 is about a scapegoat where you impute your sins to this thing and this animal leaves Jesus has done that for you in a far better way, a final way. Your sin, if you believe upon Christ, and I urge you, if you do not know this Savior, hear this good news, that the gospel is this, that your sin is imputed to Jesus, expiated to Him. It's His. He takes your sin for you. And in exchange for your sin, He gives you His own righteousness, His obedience, so that you can stand before the Father, holy, blameless, with great joy. 2 Corinthians 5.21, we talked about it in Sunday school. It's the perfect fulfillment of Leviticus 16. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for you so that in him you might become the very righteousness of God. Is not Jesus the perfect fulfillment of all prophecy? We would need days and days to go on. But I committed to myself, I wouldn't go that long. He is the perfect fulfillment. And that, again, that's just an overview of what Peter is getting at in this passage this morning and saying that you have more sure the prophetic word. You have a more sure word. If you look at the prophetic word and the way in which God has never broken a promise, he's not in the business of breaking promises. He's in the business of fulfilling promises. We've just gone through several. And if that's true, which it is, how can you then say he will fail in his final promise to come again? That's Peter's argument. He can't. He's batting a thousand. You have here in your, in, in your hands the perfect word of God validated by the prophetic scriptures. You can be sure of it. Only God could be such an author that he could fulfill the prophetic word like this. So, you can trust what the apostles say, Peter's telling you. You can trust all of, the, all of the prophets before because it was clearly God behind it all. God is the author, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God, breathed out by God. He is the ultimate author. He has superintended it all. 
He's proven it through fulfilled prophecy. You can trust the Bible. And notice, you can trust this perfect and sufficient for all you need to live a godly life Bible, and you need it desperately. I want you to notice that in verse 19. This will be the last thing that we cover. The last thing that we cover this morning, and then we'll be through. Look at, the, look at verse 19 one more time. You desperately need this word, the sure word, the Bible. Verse 19, so we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention to, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. What's Peter saying? He said, you do well to pay attention to this book. You desperately need it. Why? Why do you desperately need this book? Okay, he's just said it's, this book has been validated. It's written by eyewitnesses, but their experience was validated by God himself. So why do you need it so badly? Because, Peter says, right now, you live and you work and you fight as a Christian in a dark place. See that there in the text? In a dark place. How are you going to live? How are you going to work? How are you going to fight faithfully when there's darkness all around you if you don't have your lamp? If you don't got the light? You remember Psalm 119, 105? You know it. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's the King James Version. I did that for you. You need the light. You, you need the lamp that is Scripture to shine in the darkness that you wouldn't lose your way, right? You're on your way to the celestial city, and if you remember Pilgrim's Progress, the way is very hard. It's very challenging, but it's the good and right way. It's so easy to lose your step unless you got the lamp. Once you've got the lamp to show you where you're stepping next. You need this word so desperately. I mean, you think about it. You've got enemies all around you. You've got the world, the flesh, the devil. How much do you need the lamp, which God also calls the sword? Right? You need it so badly. And beloved, your, your king, your king has not left you without what you most desperately need. He's not left you to your own devices. Think on it. He not only rescued you from the domain of darkness and transferred you to the kingdom of light, but the kingdom of light, Jesus, then says, here is the lamp. Here is the lamp for you to walk in this world. I give you two things. I give you the promised Holy Spirit, the ever-present helper. I give you the lamp that works with the Holy Spirit to guide you. He's given you everything you need. He's given you the Holy Spirit and His Word, that sword. I was reading this passage and I thought, wow, the Word is a lamp. And it's also called a sword elsewhere in Scripture. You know what that, if you put those two things together, what you get? Lord of the Rings. Sting. What happens with the sword sting? It glows, Right? Frodo Baggins, it served him so well in the Lord of the Rings. You got a better weapon than Sting, and that's the cool weapon. And you need this word so badly, it says. Notice, notice in verse 19, as a lamp unto your feet and a, light, and a light unto your path. Notice in verse 19, it says, um, you do well to pay attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. What does that mean? You need God's word, desperately so, until the light, which is God himself, surpasses it. What's he talking about there? You need the word of God so much so, you do so well to pay attention to the sure word, until the light, which is God himself, surpasses the lamp in perfect splendor and majesty and glory. When the word of God gives way to God himself. What's he talking about there? Romans 13, 12. The night 
is almost gone. That's darkness, right? And the day is near. The day is near. What day is near? And it's the day that Peter has been talking about in these verses we spent two weeks on. The day that the false prophets and the false teachers are denying. The day when Christ returns. That day when you see him face to face. That day that when it dawns and he wipes away every tear from your eye and death will be no more. On that day, the light of the lamp of the word will be overtaken by the light of the glory of Christ. Right now you see through a damp light lake. But to come is fullness of unmatched glory. The lamp will be overtaken by the light of the glory of Christ, which is called the morning star of Jacob. I got one more prophecy for you. Numbers 24, 17. I'll just read it for you. Christ is the fulfillment of Numbers 24, 17. Listen to this. A star shall come forth from Jacob. Does that sound like Second Peter? A star shall come forth from Jacob, a scepter shall rise from Israel, and shall crush through the forehead of Moab, and tear down all the sons of Sheth. A star from Jacob is coming to crush the evil one. He already came, and now he's coming again. He's going to tear down all of his enemies who set themselves up against him, and on that great and terrible day, that star of the Lord Jesus is going to swallow up the lamp. Revelation 22, 16. We read Revelation 22 earlier. Jesus said this, I Jesus, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and, and the descendant of David, listen, the bright morning star. This is the morning star that Peter speaks of in verse 19. And notice, this will be the last thing, notice what your heart will do. Notice, it doesn't just say, a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises. It says the morning star rises in your heart. It's talking about the day of the Lord when Christ returns. I very much think, and um, very ma many, many commentators agree with what I'm about to say, that this is talking not just about the external, when he comes and makes all things new, but this is very much talking about the internal completion of the work that he started. Did he not say that he will finish the work that he started? Is that not a promise? Is not God in the business of fulfilling promises? In your hearts on that last day, <laughs> he will finish what he started and you will see him fully as he is. I can't wait for the day that the morning star rises. In my heart. Can you? I look forward to that. He will finish the inner transformation that he began. So I want you to think on it, beloved, as we, as we close. You have the prophetic, or the, sorry, the perfect, sufficient word of God in the prophetic word and in the writings of the apostles. In the old and the new, you have the perfect, sufficient word of God. And it's a lamp unto your feet. It's a light unto your path. And it's a sword written down by eyewitnesses. God, though, is the author. It's been breathed out and inspired by God himself. So I want to encourage you with my final words here to do, as God said, the day of the transfiguration. Listen to it. Listen to him. When you, when you rise up, strap on the sword. Give yourself to the promises. When you lie down, polish the sword. Give yourself to the promises. And if you do that, if you listen to him, hear in his word, it will be like a light shining in the darkness for you until the day when the word of God will give way to the final revelation of God himself in glory. And on that day we'll be able to sing together, will we not? When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is what? 
sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. And so I want to invite you, as the people of God who cling to his word until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, for you to say with me amen to that. Amen. So let it, let, it, let it be so, and let's sing together. Musicians, if you would come, let's just sing what I just sang, that song that we would be excited for the day of the Lord to come because we're clinging to his word. Let's sing that now. Musicians. Musicians.